York Airport. Get right on the Pulaski, pal. Don't look down. What have you been doing? What was I really doing walking in there with my bad haircut and ridiculous shirt? What have you been doing? God damn it! Well, your powerful people are gonna help you out of this one, buddy. You'll walk <laughs> with a limp! Seem nice enough. <laughs> After nine years in developmental flux and with several major delays, Rockstar Games releases the third title in the Max Payne series. From the very first cutscene, it's clear that several years of intense trauma have led to our lead character, Max Payne, numbing himself with heavy drinking, smoking, and prescription pain pill abuse. Max is still sarcastic, wry, and very charming in a smoldering wreck kind of way, but it's apparent that the guy is barely being held together. Okay, so let's have this discussion at the outset. I've read most major reviews as well as about 30 user reviews online, and this is easily the most divisive topic in regards to Max Payne 3, the story. Some people feel like there are far too many cinematics and it was quote unquote obvious that Rockstar simply wanted to make a film. Well, don't tell that to the nearly flawless third person gameplay, but we'll get to that. Okay, so here are my two cents. A. I understand how many of the unskippable cutscenes can slow down the pace of subsequent playthroughs. And even for initial playthroughs, I realize that the regular transition from live gameplay into cutscenes can be frequent and slightly jarring. Recording the footage for this review marks my second PC run, and I've beaten this game four times on the PS3. So, trust me, I understand. However, on a modern PC rig with a nice SSD, many more of these scenes are skippable, and the ones that can't be bypassed are simply serving as camouflage for the loading screens. There have been some fairly prominent gaming critics that didn't seem to understand this and complained as though Rockstar made these scenes unskippable on purpose. It's slightly baffling, but then people are often baffling. B. The story of Max Payne 3 is amazing. Look guys, I get it. Rockstar basically did their version of Man on Fire as well as a confluence of various Michael Mann character archetypes. Max even wears the classic grey, double-breasted Yves Saint Laurent suit that many of Michael Mann's characters wear. If you've watched my first two Max Payne reviews, it should be obvious that I'm a very, very big fan of Remedy's efforts. Max Payne 1 and 2 are precious works of art that are deeply near and dear to me. 
So I get the fandom, I really do. But Max Payne 3's tale is exceptional. Using classic character models does not mean that the characters present in Max 3 are limited, generic, or predictable. Least of all, Max himself. I won't spend time going down the entire rabbit hole, but suffice it to say, there are many twists, betrayals, shocking moments, and plenty of intrigue. There's this excellent juxtaposition of story threads. As Max gets closer to the light and the revelations, he is simultaneously hurtling into the darkest corners of hell. And that's not hyperbole. When Max finds out what was being done in the abandoned Imperial Palace Hotel, it's grim and appalling. And it's made worse by the fact that evil shit like this can and does happen. Over the years, I've read the opinion that Max Payne 3 strays from the noir themes of the first two games, and therefore is an invalid Max Payne sequel. Alright, firstly, there are phenomenal levels in this game that take place in Hoboken, New Jersey. It's nighttime, snow is falling like it did in the first game, Max has hair, a leather jacket, and a cheesy floral tie. And you battle an army of Jersey Goombas. Not you. Just like old times. The following level is set in a rain-soaked, miserable place in the darkness of night, much like in the second game. There are plenty of so-called classic Max Payne motifs sprinkled across part three. What I love so dearly about Max Payne 3 is Rockstar's masterful ability to seamlessly and respectfully weave in echoes of the past while pushing forth their own bleak plotline. This, I feel, is best exemplified when Max has a character rebirth of sorts, finally ditching the booze, shaving his head, and deciding that he wants a clear head when he takes on the proverbial Hydra. As far as Max's new look for the third chapter goes, I vividly remember getting my issue of Game Informer in July of 2009, and being shocked at the direction that Rockstar seemed to be taking our boy. I remember reading the cover story, and the representative from Rockstar stated that they were not casting James McCaffrey to reprise his role as Max. The whole thing was sacrilegious, so I had the same concerns and reservations as every other fan. I won't spoil the plot of Max Payne 3, but it's my opinion, and remember, it is just my opinion, that Rockstar extrapolated the best elements of the preceding titles and infused them with the boiling hot streets of Sao Paulo and the kinetic energy contained therein. And as far as the people out there that proclaim with conviction that Max Payne 3 is not true noir, well, the very definition of the word noir is a genre of crime fiction characterized by cynicism, fatalism, and moral ambiguity. If you don't think that this game is the epitome of all three of those concepts, you either haven't played it or you weren't paying attention. Max Payne 3 is noir defined. And it all begins with the visuals. Because you're a piece of shit. I am not a piece of shit. Well, yeah, but you're a little bitch. Sure. God damn it, man. Max Payne 3 runs on Rockstar's amazing proprietary Rage technology, based on the previous Angel Game engine. Many titles have used this engine since, to include Grand Theft Auto 4 and 5, Red Dead Redemption 1 and 2, Midnight Club Los Angeles, and of course, Max Payne 3. Even though this game is over 10 years old now, the visuals are still gorgeous. Naturally, the textures are a bit smudged and starting to show their age, but character models are still nice, and thanks to the phenomenal animation, faces in particular still react and emote impressively well. 
I really love how Max's clothes shift and displace in accordance with the cadence of his gait, and you'll see tattering, blood, feces, and whatever else Max has accumulated along the way. Many people lamented the shift from the lovely comic book panel cutscenes from the first two games to the real-time scenes in Max Payne 3. But don't forget, the comic book panels were initially used because the in-engine cutscenes would look like total ass at the time, so Remedy used them as a clever workaround that happened to become iconic. And I love them, you know that. But the cutscenes in the third game are great and have an often chaotic, frenetic feel to them. The comic book panels are present to a degree, but integrated into the real-time cutscenes. I will say, I understand how people got sick of the hazy, I'm an addict filter that blasts across the screen regularly. It's kind of cool at first, but it definitely got overused. However, the way Max Payne 3 is lit, the reflective surfaces like freshly waxed laminate tile bouncing the sun's warmth back at you, dynamic fire, and particles flying everywhere during gunfights. It's all still a nice, cool drink for the eyes, and that doesn't even make any sense. The most notable graphical flex that Max Payne 3 sports is the use of the Euphoria physics engine. Euphoria is a proprietary software specifically meant to simulate natural human movement that's modeled after the human body, to include the musculoskeletal system and the peripheral nervous system. It's been baked into the Rage engine and helps to bring characters to life in ways that had never been seen before in video games. Rockstar utilized this initially in Grand Theft Auto 4 to great effect. It's the reason a slow-moving car that bumps into Nico causes him to softly crumple onto the hood, as opposed to just knocking him flat. It's the perfect, and I mean perfect way, to bring Max Payne 3 to life. I loved the zany physics of Max Payne 2, and I never get tired of playing that game, but nothing can touch Max 3. The animations are simply incredible. As expected, the famous shoot-dodge maneuver returns, and it's better than ever. Max still leaps through the air like the video game character that he is, except now when he hits the ground, there's a tremendous sense of impact. You can feel the crunch of Max's ribs, knees, and elbows smashing into the ground, with his new, bulkier musculature helping to slightly cushion the blow. I also really appreciate the ability to remain on the ground after a shoot dodge. The first game forced Max to stand up after a dodge, which could lead to some cheap hits or even deaths. But Max 3 gives the player full control. Keep fighting in prone, supine, or sideline until you say otherwise. I adore the subtle touch of Max bracing his left leg into the ground, as if to prepare for when it's time to get up. It adds a lovely touch of realism and gives the player maximum governance. Take this clip for example. After recovering from lying prone, I quickly attempt to get to my feet and finish this enemy, but Max gets hit in the gut midway and is rocked backwards into a final stand animation. You can almost feel the rapid inertial flux, and it's just amazing, man. I also love how Max hits each surface for cover and how he crawls through windows, it's a marvel of software engineering, and the team at Natural Motion should be well proud of themselves. However, cool software alone doesn't complete a game's graphical presentation and, in my opinion, a gorgeous looking game doesn't mean shit if there isn't any artistic merit behind it. I'm not trying to wax philosophical like some pretentious boob. What do you want, boob? What I mean is that some games look amazing, like the recent Modern Warfare 2 soft reboot, remake, rechristening, whatever. That engine is amazing, but it's literally the same boring thing year after year after year. Generic Middle Eastern environment, check. Generic European environment, check. Generic North American environment, check. 
200 gigs of hard drive space, now buy our battle pass, whatever. Max Payne 3 is packed to the brim with artistic flourish and amazing levels of detail. Rockstar really went above and beyond for this game, to the point of flying out a team to Brazil with incredibly expensive and advanced scanning technology. The team occupied two studio spaces in the famous Locale studio in Sao Paulo. The team used one space to scan in multiple actors in hundreds of different outfits to then mix them in the final production to produce the various NPCs we see in the game. The other studio space was utilized to scan a multitude of everyday objects that appear in-game. The amount of effort that went into making this world feel real and lived in is what makes Max Payne 3 so enjoyable to play through for me. This is what I mean when I'm rambling about artistic merit. It's not just bland, generic geometry, mostly empty corridors and rooms like many games. It's the same thing I love about the worlds crafted in the first two Max Payne games. Those little details are everywhere. In this clip, you can see the hydraulic fluid leaking from these lines during a gunfight. They didn't need to add this, and nobody would have noticed if it was absent. But there it is. I've read criticisms from Brazilians that say the favelas of Sao Paulo and Max Payne 3 are more akin to Rio de Janeiro, with its hilly footpaths, but I imagine this was done to be more in line with the story of Max in Sao Paulo, that is to say that Rockstar wanted him charging uphill towards these gang headquarters, which wouldn't have had the same effect on a flat pathway. Anyway, this loving detail extends to every other environment as well. Been caught, motherfucker. Say you are sorry. Say you're fucking sorry. Look away from me. Look away from me. Don't you stare at me. Say you're sorry. Listen to him. Which you want first? Don't act clever, you. Look at this watering hole in New Jersey. Cracks in the penny round Calcutta tile. Tears in the booth seat leather. Beer mirrors, boxing posters, various flags, chalkboards, ashtrays, clocks, hat racks and the expected neon booze lights. It adds to the sense that this establishment has seen decades of serious use. It's hard to notice every little detail when you're airing out Guido douchers, but take your time and you'll be rewarded. Or don't, I don't care. Let us put aside our opinions on the story, the cutscenes, the load times, etc. The gunfights in Max Payne 3 are the goddamn best. There are some amazing third person shooters out there. Gears of War, Uncharted, Ratchet and Clank, and of course, the first two Max Payne games. They're all good for their own reasons. Fluid animations, hard hitting weapons, and impeccable control. Maybe with the exception of Ratchet and Clank Up Your Arsenal and Gears 2, Max Payne 3 is probably the most fun I've had with a third person shooting game. To reiterate, I understand how it can be a little annoying when the cutscenes interrupt the action a little too frequently, but when the bullets are flying, this game rules. Guns have the appropriate amount of recoil, muzzle flip, and heft to make them feel impactful in the context of a video game. Oddly, Rockstar removed the weapon selection inventory in favor of a more stripped down weapon wheel. I prefer having a multitude of options like an old school shooter, but I also don't mind the weapon wheel. I never felt like I lacked the weaponry to survive. 
In favor of a little more realism, Max will now carry his primary weapon in his offhand when wielding his sidearm. And if you dual wield sidearms, Max will drop his primary weapon. It is really strange that not a single person in Brazil has a sling and a few QD swivels lying around, but it never really bugged me that much. What does bother me is that after almost every cutscene, Max is holding his sidearm, even if you have a badass rifle, shotgun, or subgun. This is really annoying later in the game when Max encounters tougher armored enemies and you have to switch back to your powerful shooter at a moment's notice after the gameplay resumes. I've never really understood that decision, but oh well. Painkillers return as Max's health packs, and they will replenish your HP much quicker this time. It's apples and oranges. I enjoyed the old system of slow health recovery, but I also enjoyed being able to get right back into it in part 3. Rockstar also implemented a kind of last stand mode called last man standing in this game. On most difficulties, if Max is hit with a killing blow and has a painkiller in stock, the game will slow down and guide the reticle towards your would-be killer. Wussy. If you can hit them quickly enough, Max gets to keep on fighting at the cost of one painkiller. Wussy. If this is too casual for you, crank the difficulty to old school and die like a man. Wussy. I've beaten that mode, and it's deliciously brutal. Wussy. As mentioned, the shoot dodge mechanic returns along with bullet time, and it's more glorious than ever. It's fluid and brutal. Landing multiple headshots before hitting the ground is so incredibly satisfying. Rockstar made the wonderful decision to bring back the single pixel white dot reticle and, frankly, I'm unable to put into words why it feels just right to level this over a dude's coconut and land a shot, but it's very satisfying. The addition of a small hit marker and a very brief flash when you land a killing shot is just so rewarding. The superhero bullet time for Max Payne 2 has been shelved in favor of a bullet time more akin to the first title, and it feels just right. I love playing Max 3 on harder difficulties, where you get a very limited window of slow-mo. It forces me to land my shots and seek new cover quickly. Speaking of which, Another controversial addition to Max 3 is the cover mechanic. Ever since Gears of War exploded onto the landscape, cover mechanics in third-person shooters became kind of a must. Some games had pretty flimsy, rad-ass cover mechanics like Kane and Lynch, and some got it right. Some fans were pissed that Rockstar gave Max a cover mechanic as it was argued that bullet time is his cover, but I thought it was awesome especially in lieu of the aforementioned full control when you land on the ground, popping a few baddies from the floor and then hitting Q to safely line up behind the nearest cover keeps the gameplay moving during the harder sections of the game. Max can also blind fire, and it's really satisfying to wipe out the men rapidly encroaching on you. It's pretty cool to see the enemies using this mechanic as well. Another inclusion are the segments where Max is forced to perform a brief slow-mo shootout. It's often always because he's a clumsy middle-aged man, but it looks cool as hell and it doesn't overstay its welcome. There are also the on-rail segments where Max is in a fixed position, like inside of a helicopter or a city bus, and has to battle it out from there. These are flashy and over the top, and again, some fans argued that they had no place in Max Payne. But I personally love these bombastic set pieces. 
they make sense in the context of the level, and you know something? They're fun. Remember fun? Shell, this might be one of my top five games in terms of sound design. The sound effects, voice acting, and music are all top tier. I've read that many native Palestanos criticized some of the Portuguese acting in the game, but I don't have a frame of reference, so I can only take their word for it. I do know that Rockstar's director of audio and all-around bloody legend, Laszlo, shepherded a full-blown team of directors, translators, engineers, and vocal coaches over various trips to record more than 10,000 lines of dialogue used in the game. Oh, and that was just for the Portuguese lines. It's amazing listening to the details from his trip. We get in oh, and I asked him if I can roll down the window and he gets really moody. He's like, no, there's no rolling down the window here, sir. I was like, all right. Uh, I said, you know, and the glass, dude, is like that bank teller glass. You know, like, oh, wow. like I can see why you can't fucking roll the window down. <laughs> wow. And uh, I said, so this is bulletproof glass. And he said, he, he got, tells me that the whole car, he said, it, you have to be worried about people just putting a gun on top of the car and pulling a trigger and shooting a bullet straight down through your head. Uh, so that part is bulletproof as well. Um, and then he informed me that in case somebody puts a bomb under the car while we're on the way to the hotel, that the undercarriage will keep me from getting my legs blown off ah, and stuff. That's I was nice like, well, to know. this is a really relaxing city. So. The rest of this story about Laz's time in Brazil is wild and well worth a listen. The customer restroom. I could get through to the departure gates up ahead. There were Ufe all over the airport and civilians were being moved out. Looking at it one way, shutting down the airport for their escape was a weird sort of compliment, but one I didn't need. The music is another beautiful work of art. The band Health, out of Los Angeles, composed the soundtrack. Evidently, they had originally been approached by Rockstar and were under the impression that they would be sending in a few tracks for the next Grand Theft Auto, but were amazed when they were asked to record a full-blown soundtrack for the next Max Payne. Like all musical compositions, and I know this at a much smaller scale, things were changing up until the very last minute as Rockstar wanted things perfect. But suffice it to say, Health really nailed this game's music. We do hear both the piano and cello renditions of Max's classic theme in the third game, and as much as I love Kartsi Hitaka's soundtracks from Max 1 and 2, Health produced some amazing thumping beats and chunky string arrangements that alternate and mix so well with each other that it's nearly seamless. But nothing is as memorable and as incredible to me as Max battling his way through an airport as the song Tears plays in the background. The song is awesome in general, and it's the one vocal track that Health produced for the game. But the lyrics are essentially the spirit of Max's wife and child speaking to him, letting him know that it's okay to let go and move on, that he deserves peace in life. This as he dives down an escalator and blasts the Ufe in the face. Health is awesome, and you will love each other. Back home, it was time for some R&R, &R, the only way I knew how. All the music, voice acting, weapon sound effects, and Foley work are fantastic. Top tier. But the number one audio landmark for Max Payne 3 is, without a doubt, James McCaffrey's performance as Max Payne himself. As you likely know, 
I've always loved the guy as Max Payne. In the world of gaming, his voice is iconic and nostalgic in a way that only a few character voices can be. But in Max Payne 3, McCaffrey dials his performance up to a 10 and brings to life Max Payne's maddening spiral of substance addiction, traumatic experiences, and the desperate attempt to make sense of anything, to find a purpose. Watching Max desperately shuffle through this world he barely understands as he tries to save a girl in an obvious attempt to rectify his failure to save his family all those years ago is searing, and it hurts to watch, but for all the right reasons. The cutscene direction and writing are both excellent, but James's performance as the man himself is what seals the whole package. Seeing Max transform from a broken down, washed up alcoholic wallowing in his self-pity to a crazed bald man trying to make things right in one little spot of the world against all odds is phenomenal. And the voice is everything. The fact that they used McCaffrey for Max's face and motion capture adds another layer of ownership to the character that he helped to create. It really helps lend authenticity to this role. I'm so glad that Rockstar came to their senses when they were initially going to recast the role. James McCaffrey is Max Payne, except no substitutions. Oh, Jesus! Oh, God! Oh, oh, Jesus! God! Oh, Mary, Mother of Jesus! Jesus of Nazareth! Where is Fabiana, eh? She's in a place called Nova Esperanza. How do you know this, Max? One of the crotch appraisers told me just before he died. Some people say that Max Payne 2 ended happily, and that Max Payne 3 was simply a money grab for Rockstar. Let me tell you a little something about me. I am obsessed with a high artistic standard, a high caliber of craftsmanship. It's why I'm repulsed by the sea of trashy gambling addictions disguised as mobile games. But in the end, Rockstar had the rights for Max Payne, and they didn't just sit on them. And as far as the so-called happy ending of Max 2, just because Max had a dream that he was okay with his wife being dead, doesn't mean that A. This wasn't a slightly rushed ending, or B. That all of Max's problems suddenly went away, or that he wouldn't be in emotional turmoil after killing a few hundred people, losing his lover, losing his wife, seeing his dead child, not to mention the chronic traumatic encephalopathy that he uses copious amounts of opioids and booze to deal with. Or maybe it's just fiction and it's designed to make money. In the last 11 years since Max Payne 3 was released, Rockstar has only produced two, two major titles, that being Red Dead Redemption 2 and Shark Card Theft Auto. AAA video games have become much more lavish, much more expensive, and as a result, companies and their <sighs> shareholders don't take risks like they used to it seems. They want a safe, guaranteed return on their investment. They want to pump out the skeleton of a shooting game, and then slowly grow the muscles, organs, nerves, and soul around it, and they want you to pay for it. Although Max Payne 3 sold over 3 million copies in its first week, publisher Take-Two Interactive ultimately deemed the game a failure. It's just never enough, is it guys? In a way, Max Payne 3 stands as one of the last of its kind. A tightly structured, incredibly well-produced single-player story that wasn't built on a live-service, pay-to-win scheme. 
The game did have multiplayer, which, by the way, was incredibly fun back in its day. But the nearly fatal troughs and little peaks of redemption that Max Payne experiences in his final chapter are why you should play this game. In conclusion, I think the lyrics from the song Tears fittingly sum up my remembrance of the Max Payne franchise as well as the golden era of gaming as a whole. Trust us now. It's time to let me go. Give up on us. Follow what you want. Trust us now. It's time to let me go. Give up. Give our soul away. Woden grinned smugly. It was the grin of a winner. That made two of us. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me.